Coming up, I finally get my hands on an SPDOS disk interface. I play some games, Jeff does something, and we end with a type-in. Let's get on then. Disk interfaces for the Spectrum were a rare breed. Several companies produced them, but the public never really took to them, mainly due to the cost involved, not only for the interface, but the drive itself. Probably the most popular units were the Discovery Opus, that used a 3.5 inch drive, and also provided a print port and pass-through ports, and the Plus D interface. Other units were available too, including the Beta Disk Interface, the Byte Drive 500, the Clive Drive, the Crescent Quick Disk, the Disciple, the Kempston Disk Interface, and this one, the Watford Electronics SPDOS Interface. Now this interface has a story, but first the details. It sold in 1984 for £99, and if you wanted a 40-track 200k drive, that would cost you a further £149, so for a basic setup you'd be paying £250. The interface supports 35, 40 and 80-track drives, either 3, 3.5 three or 5 and a quarter inch, single or double sided, and can support up to 4 drives, so it's very versatile. When I first got this, there were no instructions, just some printed sheets, and upon further examination, they were mainly from a review from a magazine called What Micro, that was available and printed from the World of Spectrum Hardware Index. The review I actually typed out myself from this magazine, and now it returns along with the hardware itself, which was fantastic. Anyway, onto the device. The interface looks very cool, black with matching rainbow stripes. It has a hole on one side, and this is not a nice design feature, it's to allow the power lead to fit through. It has a through port in case you wanted to plug other things into it. However, I was too scared of breaking it, as I'd never seen one of these ever before, anywhere. The next thing we needed is obviously a disk drive, and it came with this one, a five and a quarter inch drive mounted in a nice external housing. Once plugged in and turned on, we insert the SPDOS boot disk, and after a short period, we get the copyright message from Watford Electronics. So far, so good. To use this interface, we have to use a basic overlay, so all commands start with print hash 4, followed by a command. So let's see what's on the disk. To do this, we enter print hash 4 colon cat, so we're using the microdrive commands here. The disk spins, and we get a list of files. Here we can see various things including the supplied programs, Taskword, Masterfile and Omnicalc. These were supplied with a retail package. There are also various utilities to format disks and copy files and create new system disks. The first thing I needed to do was to make a copy of the system disk. So with a brand new set of disks, I tried to format the first one. And it failed. Now the format command takes several parameters. First there's the usual print hash 4, and then the spectrum's format command, and then the name of the disk, and then four other options after another print command. And in order, these represent the number of the disk drive, the number of tracks, which can be 30, 40 or 80, the number of sides, 1 or 2, and the step rate, which can be 1 to 4, and represent 6, 12, 20 or 30 milliseconds. Now as you can see, there's a lot of parameters there, and I tried every combination and the furthest I got was to format and verify the first two tracks of any disk. And this was disappointing. I didn't know what the problem was, and I spent nearly a full day trying all the different settings. It could be the disks, or it could be the drive, and it appeared that the interface was fine because it was reading the disks. The next step was to try some more disks, so I dug around and managed to find a few. I tried an old Microsoft disk, as well as an old mouse driver disk, and some other random disks I found in storage, and I got the exact same error. Next, I stripped the drive down and cleaned the heads, and this failed to improve things. Now in between all of this testing, I bought another drive, and this had been restored and was fully working. The drive came from a BBC Micro, the exact drive recommended by Watford Electronics. So, this arrived. Upon trying again, the boot disk loaded, but the format failed. I checked the cable with a multimeter, 
everything seemed fine, and I tried numerous other format commands along with numerous other disks, and all of them failed. To be extra thorough though, I bought a job lot of disks with varying manufacturers, densities, tracks and sides, and all of them failed. I ran through all the permutations of the format command on several different disk types, and still the same problem. Lastly, just because I could rule them out, I tried another external casing and another spectrum, and still we got the same error. At this point, I was baffled and frustrated. I sent a message to the seller, who very kindly replied, saying that he'd only done a cat test on the disk and assumed that it worked. Luckily, that person was Mark Smith, the same person who created the ULA replacement for the Spectrum. So he knows a thing or two about electronics, and he very kindly offered to take it back to see if he could fix it. I sent it back, and after a lot of detective work, he amazingly managed to get it working. It needed a new controller chip, however, the details on the original had been scratched off. So he took a guess and went for a standard controller, and it worked. Right then, it's now back with me, so let's give it a full review. First to format a disk. Using Mark's recommendations for the drive, I formatted a disk as single-sided and 40 tracks. It took about 1 minute 22 seconds and gave a total capacity of 185k. I did try a double density disk but it failed, so I guess the drive is single-sided. The standard format command will create an empty disk, which can be used to store things like text files from word processors. However, if you want to store things and be able to catalogue the disk, you need to create a disk with the basic DOS functions included. And to do this, you need to create something called a subsystem disk. There's a tool on the boot disk that does this. You follow the prompts, and eventually you'll get a disk with all the required commands, apart from one, and for some reason the format command is not included. SPDOS has other commands, such as move and erase, which do the obvious things of moving a file to another name, in other words renaming it, and erase, well, you can guess what that one does. Now that I had a formatted disk, I copied my usual test game onto it, the birds and the bees from Bugbyte software. And this is the one I used to do speed tests across all other hardware. I merged the loader from the SVA CAS, and I had to modify it to work with SPDOS commands and then saved it, along with the code for the game, to the disk. So let's try it. Well that took about 6 seconds, and you can see from my speed test chart, it did pretty well. Loading TaskWord allowed me to write some text and then save it out. TaskWord is obviously set up to use this drive. When you create a subsystem disk, or boot from the full system disk, DOSC is loaded into memory and occupies about 3K, something to keep in mind if you plan to save large games onto it. The interface also has channels to write sequential data to the disk. Masterfile uses this method, which is a database that came with a package. This then introduces the most important question. How do you get games onto a disk? You could do what I did and manually change the loader, but games began to use custom loaders which would make this impossible. There's no snapshot button, and there's no snapshot interface that I know that supports this interface, so again, you'd be stuck. In modern times, of course, there are ways to do this. There are tools like snap to tap and this takes a snap file and creates a single tap loader. However, this didn't work. I think the addresses used for the machine code conflicted with the DOS. I tried about five different games and none of them worked. You can create a basic program and save it to disk with the name auto and this will auto boot when you reset the system. Handy if you can actually get games onto it and you want a menu to run them from. I did find another title, an older one that worked, and that was 3D Escape. This had the save and load routines in the basic listing, and changing them to use SPDOS syntax worked, sort of. When you load it you get an error, but going to line 10 allows the game to run. It seems 48k games were troublesome though, maybe the size or position of the code. Using it for files from the supplied programs is fine, 
so using it to store your own screens or basic games is easy. Once you get to know the syntax, it's fairly quick to use, but without a way of getting games onto the disc, this would only appeal to more serious users. The interface was later released with an updated DOS by Kempston Electronics, and that had an added copy command, and this is a tape to disc converter program, according to the documentation, and this was accessed by using the standard Spectrum copy command. However, this was not included with the earlier Watford version. Overall then, it's a brilliant piece of hardware that works well and is very fast, but without support from serious games companies or the ability to get programs to run, or in fact onto the disc easily, it would not be on the shopping list for the majority of users. This is The Simpsons, Bart vs The Space Mutants, released by Ocean in 1991. Space mutants have invaded Springfield, and they plan to take over the entire planet. For some reason, Bart has X-ray glasses, and is the only person who can see them, and so he sets off to sort them out. The game is split into various sections, with the first one being on the streets of Springfield. Here, Bart has to use his glasses to see which inhabitants have been taken over, and he can then jump on their heads. On this level, there are purple objects, and these are the things that the aliens need to complete their plan, and so Bart has to destroy them. Bart walks along a nicely drawn street, and has to avoid various mutants. Pressing down on the controls will switch on X-ray vision, and if the people there are mutants, you'll be able to see them. There were some purple objects that didn't seem to do anything when jumped on, and giving them a quick spray had no effect either. I later discovered that some objects, like trash cans, need a bit of a longer spray. Later on there's a washing line, and walking across this, we'll drop the contents onto more purple things. As you move along you can go into various shops, and here you can buy things like a wrench, a key or a rocket. To do this you need money, and this is collected from the various parts of the level, like bushes, or when you jump on people's heads. And these are used to interact with various objects. For example, you can use the whistle to bring somebody to the window of the school, who will reward you with more coins. I found it a little bit dull, to be honest. And also, when you get killed, you get sent back to some sort of checkpoint, which can be all the way back to the start of that particular level or section. Some of the objects are difficult to get to, because not all things can be used as platforms, which is annoying. Some windows, for example, you can use, others you can't. If you get far enough, you'll come across a statue, and here you can use the rocket that you bought, which can be used to destroy the purple thing, and then after this you get on a skateboard. You have little control here, other than going a little bit faster and jumping, and I don't think there's any real reason for this particular part of the game. The whole thing then continues in the same fashion, dodging aliens, jumping on people's heads, and spraying purple things. If you get to the end of the level, which I couldn't, then there's a boss battle where you throw things at Nelson. From here on in, this is the RZX playback you're watching, because I'm just not good enough, or could stay alert long enough to be honest. The levels are pretty much the same. First you have to collect a load of hats by knocking them off women's heads and picking them up from the floor. And there's a bit of repeating platform action too, and a few empty screens. The next level sees you collecting balloons from the funfair. Yes, it's very repetitive, and a lot of the alien patterns are pretty much the same. On this section you do get some really bad mini-games, where you have to line three things up or burst three balloons. Again, no reason for this. I mean, you do get extra coins, but that's about it. Next you have to collect exit signs, etc, etc. The graphics are nice, with places and people from the episodes depicted quite well. 
The sprites are also nice, and everything moves smoothly, and the control is crisp. Sound is minimal though, with just jumping and collecting and dying really, and that's about it. I felt a bit underwhelmed with the whole thing. I suppose this is one for Simpsons fans only, and it did get favourable reviews at the time. A game for fans and people that like repetitive platform action. This is Cosmic Kanga, released by Micromania in 1984. As weird Spectrum games go, this has to be up there with the best, or worst, depending on how you look at it. You have to help Cosmic Kanga find his spaceship so he can return home, wherever that sort of weird place is. The game takes the form of a scrolling platform shoot 'em up with a large cosmic kanga bouncing about and shooting enemies. The control is tricky to get used to, as it only has an effect when you land, so the choice you make, either up, down, left or right, will start from the point that you hit the ground and cannot be changed until you land again, and that takes some getting used to. If you make the wrong choice, and you miss that platform, you'll collide with the nasty and there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. You can collect things as you go along for extra points, and on the first level anything that looks like a vehicle, avoid. It's a very tricky game to control because of this, and it can be very frustrating. The scrolling is nice, and the graphics are large and mostly well drawn. The game has a lot of levels too, so plenty of variety. Sound is minimal, with a rendition of Tiny Kangaroo Downsport at the start of each level, plus a few effects for shooting, explosions and collection. The first level is the airport, and if you can get past this, you deserve a medal, because I tried and tried and failed. Using the RZX playback, the next level is Egypt, and the game is pretty much exactly the same, except with different graphics. You then get a vertical level, which looks even more challenging than the horizontal ones. It's then back to the normal play in the ocean, and this repeats for several other levels as well. Two horizontal levels, one vertical, but with different graphics. Eventually Kanga does get home, but I'm not going to spoil that for you. Overall this is a tricky and very frustrating game at times, and I suppose it's one for masochists only. This episode we have not one, not two, but three new games for you, all from the same company, Vintage Software Systems. These games were released in 2021, and each of them comes with a tap file so you can load it into an emulator, a PC executable so you can play it on your computer, and a variety of different audio formats so you can load it into a real spectrum if you wanted. The first game is Super Alien Blast, and it's a very competent version of Galaxian. There's a rather nice parallax scrolling starfield, and the usual formations and typical Galaxian action. The game plays well, and the aliens in this version are particularly good at trapping your ship in the corner of the screen, so stay in the centre if possible. Sound is used well, but sadly there's no swooping sound when the Galaxians dive. Overall this is a really good version of the classic then. 
And this is the tap file running on an emulator. Loading up the PC version, the game is identical even down to Color Clash. This version has additional settings to adjust various things. You can configure a controller and change the settings for the emulated CRT, or you can go full screen. The next game is Cosmic Space Attack, another shooter, and probably my favourite of all three. This game reminds me very much of Arcadia from Imagine Software. Packs of aliens float down the screen, and you have to destroy them to move on to the next level. You can use your thrust to move up the screen, and you have to avoid the aliens and the bombs that they're dropping. As you play, your fuel reduces, and this can be replenished by collecting fuel tins that appear randomly. Again, the graphics and sound are fine, using the same ship sprite and sound from the first game. Control is good, but it's not an easy game. But despite that, I still really enjoyed playing this. The PC version is identical, so there's no point in showing that. And the last game is Super Meteor Blast, and this is a version of Asteroids. The familiar ship is here, along with solid looking asteroids and the gameplay mimics that of the arcade. Your ship's thrust though is slightly different, and you don't get continued movement like in the arcade, instead you have inertia and you gradually slow down. And I think this is a much better mechanic in my opinion. You also have hyperspace to get out of tight spots if you need to. Graphics and sound follow the previous games, reusing the effects, and the gameplay is great. I've played a lot of Asteroids variants on the Spectrum, and this is a pretty good version. Again, the PC version is identical, apart from the CRT settings. If these games look interesting to you, then head over to the website on the screen. Because they're not free, you do have to buy them, but the price is cheap enough that it won't put a hole in your pocket. Definitely worth checking out if you like these types of games. One of the great things about the ZX Spectrum is there's always a new game to find. Yes, new games are being released all the time, but sometimes if you look back you find something that you've never played before. There I was, doing a bit of research, I was going to do a section on RPGs on the ZX Spectrum. I thought that would be quite quick, there weren't a lot of games. And then I stumbled across this, a diamond in the rough. A gem, certainly, but a bit rough around the edges. Legends of the Land. Legends of the Land was written by Matisse Kostevec. Matisse started writing the game, I'm guessing when he was about 12, and spent three years writing it, finishing it when he was about 15 in 1989, 88. He then started talking to companies about releasing it, in particular Mastertronic, but ended up never releasing it. Then, around 1985, it ended up on the internet and was released through the world of Spectrum. Probably to not very many people. There wasn't a lot of demand for Spectrum games around 1995, and anyone who was playing Spectrum games was probably going back and reliving the old classics of their childhood. Chucky Egg, Jetpack, etc. The game's an RPG and uses a landscaping technique similar to Mike Singleton's used on the Lords of Midnight and Doomstalk's Revenge. In the instructions for the game, Matejek does apologise for the controls, and I can see why playing it now. The controls are a bit cumbersome. It's quite difficult to get into and get hang of the controls, but once you do, there's a game of incredible depth in there. 
Like the Lords of Midnight, you have to travel around the land recruiting lords to your cause. But there's more to it than the Lords of Midnight. You can cast spells, you can ride dragons, you can travel by boat. You have to gather food and build campfires to keep your people well. You have to drink water and wine. There's a quite in-depth story around it. Again, kind of reminiscent of the Lords of Midnight, where a wronged lord has to retake his kingdom. You do this, as I've said before, by travelling around the map and recruiting characters to your cause. This is your main activity at the start of the game. In the main screen at the top right hand corner you have a display window which shows you the landscape and down the left hand side there's a view that shows you various information. Who you're controlling, their location, what date is and how many coins you have. As you travel around the landscape you'll see various things, temples and towers and citadels and huts where sometimes you can find people. When I first started playing this game I found it quite difficult to get into but once I did I found a game of incredible depth and while I'm pretty sure I don't have the time to complete this game now I think if I'd have got this when I was young around 15 myself I would have absolutely adored this game and spent loads and loads of time playing it. I think that was one of the main draws for me to this game when I first found it. That, and there were so many parallels with my own game. My own game took three years to write. I'm pretty sure hardly anyone's played my own game. But certainly this would have been a game I loved back in the day. If I'm going to criticise it, I've already criticised the mechanics. One thing that niggled, and I didn't realise early on, was that when you move one character, time passes for all characters. So unlike the Lords of Midnight, where you can go around every character and do their daily movement, if you move one character till the end of the day, it's the end of the day for everyone and no one can move until the next day. You get round this using the follow command. You can set one character to follow another character. And in the end, what you end up doing, or what I ended up doing, was setting one character to follow the main character of the game. I must admit as well, the first character I found, I just could not recruit to my cause. I tried bribing them, talking to them, threatening them, pleading with them. Everything that you can do in this game, and they wouldn't join my cause. I became a bit downheartened, but I moved on from there, and then found an enclave with loads and loads of characters I could recruit to my cause. There almost seemed to be too many. As well as that, there were loads of additional objects that I could pick up. This really is a hidden gem of a game. If you like RPGs, if you like the Lords of Midnight and like stories about swords and sorcery, pick this up and check it out and give it a go. I think games like this deserve to be played at least once or twice by people. And I'm sure some people really get into it. I'm also pretty certain now that completing it will take hours and hours, if not days and days of game time. So that's Legends of the Land. Certainly a hidden gem, if a rough, uncut gem. Until next time, happy gaming. This is Moa, that appeared in What Micro in October 1984. Now, there have been many lawnmower-style games for the Spectrum, and this one is probably the most advanced typing version that I've seen. The game is about one A4 page in length, with a few machine code parts. Initial attempts to run the game produced an error, but this was quickly fixed. The next problem was when you hit a rock or strawberry or football, your lives were not reduced. The listing had a duplicate line in, line 711. So with a bit of digging to find the variable that held the number of lives and reducing this in line 712 worked, but only for rocks. The lines for strawberries and football left no adjacent lines free, so I can only assume hitting these just reset the lawn. OK, let's have a go then. The idea is to mow the lawn and avoid certain things that damage your lawn mower. In the garden are rocks, which blunt your lawnmower, and surrounding the lawn are priced strawberries, and these must be avoided as well. And also, next door's football can bounce on the lawn as well. As you progress with cutting the grass, you may run over ground that's already been cut, and this reduces your oil. This can be replenished by collecting the magenta oil tins that are randomly placed.
Once you've cut enough grass, you move on to the next lawn, and even more of the area needs to be trimmed. It's a simple game, but fun to play. This is probably the first time it's been seen for over 30 years, and it will be available to download from my website soon.